so much this morning. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, I hope you bring your Bible to church on Sundays. I hope you don't just use it on Sundays, though, either. I hope you use it all week long. This is God's Word to us and how we get to know Him and have a relationship with Him. He speaks to us. And so I hope you have your Bible today. But we're going to be in Genesis 2 as we continue in our series on foundations. We're going to spend this week on that, and then we're going to take a break for a couple weeks. Uh, for Christmas time, I like to, at Christmas, um, spend one Sunday looking at a, a character of Christmas. And so we're going to look at that next week. And then the following week, look at a characteristic of Christ from a passage that isn't necessarily a nativity story. But looking at who is this child in the manger? What does the Bible reveal about him? And so we're going to look at that the next two weeks together. But today we're going to finish up. We started last week into looking at this on foundations, on the aspect of the foundation of marriage and um, a critical institution. In fact, the foundation of marriage predates any other institution. It's before you have government, before you have the church, before any other organization is formed, God creates and forms marriage. And that is a foundational element to our society. It's a foundational element um, in in our churches. And so we need that. But because it's so important, I want to look at, just expand for one more week today and look at a critical aspect of marriage, and that is marriage communication. Now, let me state at the beginning here as well, for those of you that aren't married, there's, I know many that are singles or are youth or whatever, um, don't just tune this out. Uh, and say, well, he's speaking on marriage, I get a pass today. Communication is vital to all relationships. And learning how to communicate and learning different aspects of that is, is so foundational. And so, so tune in and take notes, and this is for you as, as well. But I would agree with marriage author uh, Dwight Small, who said the heart of marriage is its communication system. The heart of marriage is its communication system. So in other words, the lifeblood that flows into all other aspects of the relationship between a husband and a wife is driven by communication. So working together through major life changes, which might be a job change or moving or working through parenting or, or health situations, whatever it might be, as you work that through as a one flesh union, as a couple, that necessitates and is built upon or is pumped through the lifeblood of marriage communication. In fact, you think about how vital communication is. How many of you have ever traveled abroad to a country that doesn't speak your language? Have you noticed when you're at another country and everybody's speaking a different language that you don't speak? how isolated you feel. It, it, it's, it's very lonely. You can be in a crowd of people and you can feel very alone because they're not speaking your language. And so usually what happens is, is people out of a desire to communicate. Now, we want relationships. God's made us relational and we want to then converse with people. So we, we resort to two things. We resort to big hand gestures. And we're trying to give, you know, motions. And, and then for whatever reason, the other thing we do is we start speaking very loud. And I have to tell people, listen, they aren't blind and they aren't deaf. They just speak a different language. And so you can do motions and those things. But we do all that because we want to communicate. We want to relate. We want to have a relationship And communication is at the core of that. And so as we looked at last week in Genesis 2, looking at some foundational laws of marriage, um, look at verse 24 and 25 again. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. There is a union, a bond that is formed there in marriage to become one flesh. We talk about the different laws that are given there, but also just the intimacy of the relationship, not only in the physical aspect, 
but in the emotional, um, working through spiritual things together, that in every way there is nothing hidden from the other person. That necessitates good communication skills to do that. So, how good of a communicator are you? Well, we're going to find out. I'm going to give you a quiz. Now, I know you all would have rather that I didn't do this and, and maybe would have tuned on live streaming today instead. But if you have your notes, flip them over. If you don't have a set of notes, you can take out a, a sheet of scratch, sheet of paper, and there uh, is going to be questions on the screens for you. But I want you to, first of all, and I want you to do this as an individual. This isn't like you and your, your spouse and, and uh, they're going to tell you what to write down. As an individual, here is, first I want you to do is, how would you rate your communication skills on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being poor to 10 being great? So just mark down, how good of a communicator do you think that you are? Okay? And then on if you are married, I also want you to make a mark for how good of a communicator you think your spouse is. I may have to do marriage counseling for some of you after this, this service. You don't have to show your spouse that your answers. Um, but how good of a communicator are you? How would you rate that? Then the next question is we're going to now, we're going to go through a few things and discover kind of how you communicate. So... How would you describe your communication? Is it that you stonewall? You're going to be the one that you don't need to talk. You just do your part and there's, you know, it's more of the silent, strong type that there's not communication. Or are you the, the social media? Uh, we'll rank it one as a social media. It's just the highlights. It's surface level and it never gets deep into into to the emotional aspects of your relationship, but it's kind of the social media level. So are you stonewall social media, or are you a staff meeting where you talk, but it's all about let's schedule out things, and we've got to talk through the, the fundamentals or what is the necessary things to run this home, and it, you talk through only the essentials. Uh, or is it that it is a soulmate, that, that we work through those things, but we also talk through my feelings and what I'm working through and, and maybe some things that I'm concerned about and those things. How would you rate yourself as a communicator on those things? So circle one of them on your page. I'm not going to ask you to circle for your spouse. This one, um, you can just do your own. Number two, how much time do you spend communicating per week with your spouse? And then I, again, I, I'm talking about Serious communication and having time to talk, not, not when there's a crowd of your children all around and just husband and wife. Is it zero to 15 minutes, 15 to 45 minutes, 45 minutes to two hours, or two hours plus on a week? I'm going to ask you a little bit later on in the service how much you think is an average on that. Number three. How would you describe your types of words used? Um, is it equal criticism and compliments? That, that is an abbreviation for compliments. Do you say, well, I feel like I give pretty equal. I, I criticize or give negative things, but I also give positive things. I'm equal on that. Or would you say, no, I give, I give less criticism, but I give more compliments. Or are you, no, I give more criticism and probably less compliments to my spouse or to even people around me if you're not not married you might just say even in regards to relationships do you feel like you're more complimentary or critis critical fourth question are, are you are you guys uh, getting a good grade yet so far <laughs> and i want you all to fail um number four is when a conflict arises your tendency is are you uh, the silent treatment I mean, i'm angry so now you're going to get it i'm not talking to you for till whenever um till jesus returns um <laughs> or are you a sweep it under the rug yeah i got hurt but you know we never resolved it but we're just going to let now let's just let's just ignore it as if that hurt never happened or i never hurt you 
and so we're going to sweep it under the rug, and we never deal with it. We never resolve the conflict. We just finally just say, well, we're not going to talk about it anymore. Um, or are you, <laughs> is it World War III, um, where it's shoot away? I mean, I'm going to let you know I am not happy, and I've got guns blazing, and, and it's an all-out war. Or is it that you seek peaceful reconciliation, that you work through it? Let's work this through and, and develop um, reconciliation there. So, so circle one of those as well. What kind of a communicator are you? So now, I don't, I don't need to see your quizzes. It's not a turn them in. This is really for a self-evaluation. I should have told you at the front end. Maybe you'd be more honest. Um, nobody has to see your answers. That's really for you to just evaluate um, how good you really think you are at communicating. So if this is a foundational element, marriage is a foundational institution and communication is the, the heart of that, that drives the lifeblood, what does God say about it? How can we become better at this so that I can be better at united in a one flesh union with my spouse, so that I can be better at, at relationships around me? What does God say on communication? Well, I want to look at some points with you this morning and, um, and hopefully it'll help us. Uh, to develop, develop stronger relationships. Because as I said before, especially moms and dads, the greatest gift that you can give your children is a mom and dad who love each other and love the Lord. And so developing this and learning how to even communicate with your kids and kids being able to communicate with their moms and dads. Um, this is all critical, critical stuff here. So let's, let's pray together and we'll jump into some aspects of communication this morning. Father, thank you for... Uh, the institution that you created of marriage and the opportunity and just how you made us relational. God, that we desire to have friends and we desire to have a church family to communicate with and relate to and, and, and spouses. Uh, and so God, I pray that you'd help us to, to take some points from your word this morning that we would get better at this. There is nobody here, myself included, that has mastered this. Uh, we are sinners in need of grace. And our spouses are sinners in need of grace. And people around us are sinners in need of grace. And so in no way are we perfect at this. And so we need your grace, your help. Would you give us insight into your word this morning on this? And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to give you some things here to, to look at. First of all is a need. If we're going to become good at this, we need, we need to have a compassionate foundation. If we're going to be good communicators... Um, communication in marriage that is godly is grounded in love. And I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13 with me then for a moment. 1 Corinthians 13. And Paul's going to emphasize the importance of, of having a loving foundation in our speech as it relates to, as we relate to people. Um, and so 1 Corinthians 13, he says in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. You can have eloquent speech and, and you, can, you can know just how to win an argument, but if, if there isn't love in your eloquent words, if there isn't an aspect of that, then it's just, it's just noise. And so we need to have Love, and this love is an agape love that seeks the best interest of others. It's, it's sacrificial. It's modeled after God who, the Bible says in 1 John 4, God is love. And he demonstrates that. He's manifested it through sending his own son, Jesus Christ. So notice what he says going on though. And think about this in verses 4 through, through 7 in the, in the relationship aspect. Love suffers long, verse 4, and is kind. Love does not envy Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now think about those as it relates to a relationship. And so if... if if we're going to have proper communication, it's going to have to have an aspect of love. 
I'm going to hope all things. I'm going to endure all things. Love is patient. It's kind. And so that is a foundation there, that that is an aspect of uh, that if a, a God-like communication, godly relationships, this has to have a foundation of compassion. And the reality is, is this really ties to a need for grace. So we might tie love and grace together because the reality is, is we're very different. People around you are different than you. Your spouse is different than you. You're men and women and men and women are different in their communication desires and needs and abilities. Um, I, I was reading um, it was Jimmy Evans, uh, author of A Marriage on the Rock, and he put it this way. He said, men are emotionally modest and physically immodest. In other words, they don't mind showing off their muscles and their physique, but they're much more careful about uncovering their soul. On the contrast, women are the opposite. A woman is physically modest and emotionally immodest. She's more self-conscious about her body, but yet she'll stand at a checkout counter and tell a perfect stranger some of the more intimate details of her life. And that is just a, uh, maybe it's a broader uh, paintbrush there, but it's the idea of that, that guys are going to be more careful with the, the communication and opening up than, than women are. In fact, and that goes back all the way back to, that's just bred in us who we are as men and women. It goes all the way back to even as children. And a Harvard study, I found this interesting, they did a study of, of preschoolers, several hundred preschoolers and researchers. They, they recorded these preschoolers as they would play on the playground and stuff like that. And they analyzed the difference of communication between the boys and the girls. They said all of the sounds, 100% of the sounds that came from the, women, or from the girls were actual words that you could understand. They were intelligible However, only 60% of the sounds that came from little boys were recognizable. The other 40% were like vroom and arg and all these different noises that they make on, on the playground. And there's just a difference of communication there. Um, and that difference persists. Uh, they, they discovered that on, on, into adulthood, communication experts say that the average woman speaks over 25,000 words per day while the average man speaks only a little over 10,000. So there's just a difference in, in each other. Your spouse is different than you. And so there's got to be a compassionate foundation and grace that, that is brought into this saying, you know what, my, my husband or my wife, her communication needs are different than mine. So out of grace, I, I'm going to make time. Or out of grace, I, I know I feel like I'm dragging words out of him, trying to get his thoughts. But out of grace, I'm going to be gracious in this and, and our communication. And so uh, that's important. In fact, we've got to grow in that. That's why Paul or Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, he says, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to understanding. Or with understanding. And, and it actually has a continual effort there that's involved. In other words, continue to learn how to communicate better. Can continue to learn, husbands, what your wife's needs are. Study her. So I, I tell guys when I'm doing counseling sometime, listen, you may have think that you, you got everything down on your wife and, and you married her. Well, all you got is you got your high school diploma on her. Continue studying her to get your bachelor's degree on her. And then continue to work towards your master's degree on her. And then your doctorate degree on her. And keep on doing research and continue more and add more degrees. That you know her more than anybody else. And dwell with them with understanding. So you help meet her needs and you communicate in a way that relates to her. And so that, that is so important. And, and again that grace aspect is necessary. We recognize that none of us are perfect. Let me give you a little hint. Your spouse married a sinner. And you married a sinner. So that means there's going to be conflicts at times. There's going to be problems. And you have to have grace that's involved with that. An excellent book that I've been just, just finishing up listening to in my truck is When Sinners 
Say I Do uh, by Dave Harvey. And um, a great one if you're looking for something to help there. So there's a need for a compassionate foundation. Secondly, in communication, there's a need for committed... Oh, I'm just giving them all out to you there. A need for committed time. Committed time. Um, it requires investing in each other. Now that seems like such a basic concept that we'd say, of course, if you're going to communicate, that's going to take time. But we're in a society that is busier now today than I think in any other society in the history of the world. And, and so making that as a priority to communicate with your spouse really takes a willful effort, a volitional uh, endeavor. And, um, and so people are saying today, in regards to their spouse, they say, well, we share a bed and we share a house, but I feel like that person is a stranger to me. We don't take any time to have a relationship, and I don't even know who they are. I don't know what they think, and, and it's, we're running so hard that we don't take time for that to develop intimate communication. So I asked one of the questions I asked earlier was to rank how much time do you spend talking to your spouse on a week? So here's a question. How much time do you think is average for a husband and wife to have, just between the two of them, communication per day? Any guesses? 15 minutes? 45? Four. Four is the average. It's actually a little bit less than that. It's 27.5 minutes per week is the average that husbands and wives are spending in close communication one-on-one -on -one to each other in their relationship. It's no wonder that marriages are on such a rocky foundation today because we aren't building time into it to spend with each other, to sit down and talk, to talk through what's going on with the kids and or let's just talk through how your day was and those things. Four minutes a day is the average in our society right now. As Bernard Shaw once said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's already taken place. We kind of think, well, yeah, we're communicators. That's the biggest problem is really a lot of times we aren't. We're not, when we start to evaluate and we keep track, we're really not taking the time to do so. And think about this as the Bible illustrates for us the illustration of a husband and wife in Ephesians 5, it's modeled by the relationship of Christ and his church. Now, what does the Bible expect in the communication between us and Christ? Four minutes a day? Once a week on Sundays? No, actually it says in the very next chapter in Ephesians 6, pray without ceasing. A continual effort to take time to talk with God and to hear from God. That's why I, I, I mentioned that it's important that this is, this is God's word to you. You should take time hearing from God and take time talking to God. Well, in the same way we are expected, that's the relationship analogy of a husband and wife, we should be taking time to communicate with our spouses. So some practical ideas would be to go for a walk together. Take some time to do that or, or to you know, if, if, you're, if you have a lot of kids in the home, after dinner, have the kids clear the table and clear out and sit down with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and just talk for a little bit. Um, whatever it is, or put the kids to bed at night and just say, we're not going to just turn the TV on and veg out side by side, never actually building a relationship. Let's put the kids to get bed and let's just sit on the couch and let's talk for a little bit. Doing just practical stuff or going for a ride. Hey, I'm going to run down to the grocery store. Can we just go along? We'll talk in the car. And finding time to invest in each other. Let, let me give you some practical minimal goals. Minimum goals that I, I once heard from James Dobson on Focus on the Family. Give. And he, he figured a good minimum goal for meaningful time as a couple would be 15 to 30 minutes a day. Plus two hours a week. Plus one night a quarter. Plus one weekend a year. So a weekend getaway as a couple, a night per quarter, two hours a week, and 15 to 45 minutes a day is helpful. Now, that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? That's, that's, a, that's a goal to work towards in building time with, it, to your, with your kids. And, um, and what I find as well is, just, this is just the reality. 
children take a lot of time in the home. It's harder. It takes more effort. When you're raising kids, it takes effort um, and, and to make sure you invest in each other because we're investing in our kids so much. I've heard many men that have said after their, their kids have grown out of the house, man, I'm more in love with my spouse today, my wife today than ever before. What changed? Well, it changed the amount of time that you invested in each other and had to do that. And so it's worth the while. If marriage is a foundational institution, that it's worth the investment. And so you must invest time. Third aspect here is commending words. There's a need for commending words, uh, for complimentary words. There might be another way to say that. Listen to what Solomon says about the power of your words. Proverbs 18, 20 to 21, he says, A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And, those, and then it actually goes right from there, uh, and, and just two verses later, and it relates to a marriage situation and says, uh, regarding that the man is blessed who, who has a wife. And, and so the power of your words. In fact, uh, James even talks about the power of the tongue in James 3, being that of like a, a, a rudder on a ship uh, or, or the bit in a horse's mouth. The, the, the amount of impact that words have, a bit in a horse's mouth, this little teeny bar can turn a horse. This little this little rudder on a ship can turn this huge vessel in different ways. In the same way, the power of our words can turn a marriage relationship or even other relationships around us. How impactful our words are. And so we need to start to use words like, I'm sorry, or please, or boy, thank you. Man, you look great today. Or man, I appreciate you. Use commending good words. Um, we're, we're called as Christians and spouses not only to not tear each other down, but to actually build each other up, uh, to encourage one another. Paul says in Ephesians 4, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And he adds, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So now I know what some of you might be thinking. Well, okay, so I should be always... I should never be critical or those things. So, so, pastor, what do I do when my wife asks me, how does this outfit look on me? And it's not my favorite. How do, how do I respond to that? You, know, you said don't be critical. My words should be commending to, to build up. Well, I, I would say two things regarding that. Um, one, I would assume, ladies, when you ask your husband those things, you ask because you genuinely want to know his opinion. A and you want to, to have an idea there of what he thinks. And, and you care about his opinion. So, so don't ask unless you really want the truth. Um, don't ask to be lied to. Uh, and I think that's important. Don't, don't, don't ask your husbands to lie to you. Um, but I think a, a key verse to keep in mind here is Ephesians 4.15. To speak the truth in love. So... So husbands don't lie either. Speak the truth um, in that and respect your wife enough uh, to give her the truth. But the second aspect of that is, is keep them in mind that that's supposed to be born in love. So don't just say, man, you look like a, a bag lady with that thing on. You know, <laughs> that isn't going to help her feel good. It doesn't matter what she puts on now. She's not going to feel good. And so you can say things like, you know, that's not my favorite. You have some other ones that I really like on you, but that one's not my favorite. It doesn't, it, it, I, I like different colors on you or whatever, but that's, so you can be kind without having to, and, and to be truthful. We speak the truth in love. And so we give commending words in that way um, and uh, help our spouses. And you're a helpmate. I mean, we keep in mind that God put us together as a helpmate. 
we come alongside each other. We complete each other. We encourage each other. And so everyone responds and enjoys uplifting and commending words. Um, let me keep moving on here. So we've talked about the need for compassionate foundation and committed time and commending words. There's also a need for considerate dialogue. And what I mean by this is really just looking at the aspect on a practical level of making sure that my communication is, is done right. Um, we can speak and not be understood. We can hear and not listen. And so learning how to communicate um, in, in a way that is helpful. Um, and so, again, it goes back to 1 Peter 3, to study each other, to know how are they going to hear this. Uh, let me put this in a term that my, my husband, who's kind of a, you know, a blockhead on emotions, how am I going to get this into a way? Let me use a hunting analogy so it gets to him. You know how that deer feels, whatever, you know. Using ways to, to, to get it into there so you can communicate. Um, and the reality is we come from different backgrounds. We observe and learn this growing up very differently. How your parents and how your family communicated. And it may have been your family was just straight out truth. Man, we're not sugarcoating it. Here it is. Bam, bam, bam. Um, you just say what you think and that's the law. Or your family might have been, you know, we don't, we don't really confront one another. You know, we don't, we don't get into those things. And, and so the way you think about communication might be different. Um, and, and, and so you might be one who uses subtle signals. And you're thinking, man, why is he not getting these subtle signals? And he's thinking, everything's great. Everything's great, man. I, my wife loves me. And she's thinking, man, he is so dumb. I could smack him upside the head with his pan and... And you're just not getting the signals because you've, you've kind of learned to communicate differently. And so you have to work that through. Because um, uh, reality is, is miscommunication can cause major problems. My, my, favorite, my favorite story um, of that is, is one that I read um, in, a, in a book called Pardon Me, But You're Eating My Doily. Uh, it's a it's by Prudence Leith. He's a, he's a caterer and restauranter, and he, he wrote this book about different stories. And this is a true story about this couple that they had traveled to the Far East, and, um, and they didn't speak the language, and they, they brought along their little poodle dog, you know, and they were at this restaurant, and, and they were eating and enjoying this meal, but they, they couldn't communicate to the, to the, the person because they didn't speak the language, and they wanted to get some food for their little beloved little poodle dog. And so they the waiter, the, 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 the cook came out and, and they were trying to give like, you know, food and pointing to the dog and those things. And he, he said, oh, I understand. He takes the dog back and 30 minutes later comes back with the dog out on a platter cooked. Miscommunication can cause major problems. And so we've got to know how to do that. Um, I'm sure that didn't go real well. Um. So how do we then effectively and comprehensively communicate with our spouse? Let me just give you a couple quick things here, some tips. First of all, again, it kind of goes back to the first point. You've got to show that you care. You have to show your spouse, I, I want you to be able to share with me. I will make time. I'm, I'm not going to be while we're, you know, while we're talking, I'm going to be checking my Facebook post. That doesn't show that you care. Or I'm going to be flipping through the channels. Yep, that's great, hon. Boy, that sounds like a great day. Hold on. Can you move to the side a second? That, that doesn't show that you care. So, so give the time, give the attention in those ways. And, and allow them, this is important, allow them the freedom to share deep things with you. And you don't ridicule that. That you don't, when they share, man, I was really afraid over this situation. They'll say, well, that's stupid. Why would you be so afraid of that? You know what you just did? You just had her put a fig leaf back on. And she's going to say, I'm not sharing my deep thoughts. It's the same way with kids, by the way. When, when your kids come to you and say, mom or dad, I was really thinking about this. And you might think, oh, that's silly. Listen to them. When they open the, the windows of their heart to you and they let you in, you go in there. And you listen and you affirm and you talk with them and you guide them. Because if you ridicule in those moments and you act like I don't care about your emotions and your feelings, 
I'm telling you, the shutters will close back up. And so you have to show that you care. Second of all, another tip there is listen to understand. Um, and I think this is something that men do worse than women. Um, we listen to fix. Um, we we want to fix the situation. So we're hearing, oh, yes, you got this wrong, this wrong, and this wrong. If you do this, this, and this, this would fix this situation. I just literally this, this uh, week was... Um, got nailed on this by my wife and one of my daughters as one of my daughters was talking through some things regarding schedule and challenges and I was like well that's that's easy you got this this and this and I was like here's what you do and they're like would you stop we're, we're not saying it needs fixed we just wanted to share what's what some of the struggles or things going on right now I'm like why you know like why don't you want me to fix it I mean that's what I'm good at I can fix it I can tell you what to do and 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 um, and, and so we struggle with listening to understand. Okay, I understand. And maybe it isn't, you're not wanting me to fix it. You just want me to hear it. You want me to understand what you're thinking, what you're feeling. And, and I can be a part of that and come alongside you in that. And that's why James says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. That we, have, we, we are going to be quicker to listen um, in that. And, um, and see and understand. So then, and then another aspect to that though, and I think this would speak more to the women then, is speak to be understood. Uh, men have a hard time listening to understand, but speaking to be understood. So it's not just vague generalities and hoping that he gets the signals. Listen, I'm just going to tell you straight up, women, a lot of us men are dense. We're just, we aren't getting it. So just tell us what you're feeling, right? That would help us so much. Um, but speaking to be understood is what I mean by that. Um, and and um, using the words in the right way at the right time also. The aspect of a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in, in settings of silver, Proverbs tells us. And so finding the right time, the right way to make sure, you know, listen, when he's out there and, um, it, you know, working underneath the car trying to fix something and he's you know he's up to his elbows in grease and he's working on it that's probably the, not the best time to say you know we need to have a discussion about you know our, our our little little johnny he's not thinking about little johnny he's thinking about why is this bolt not coming off and um and so find the right time and the right way to speak to be understood um and so there's just considerate dialogue um to work that through. Next, I'm going to try to keep moving here, is the next aspect is um, conflict resolution. And there's a need for this. The reality is if you've been married for any length of time, you'll, you'll know that conflict arises. It just, it's going to happen um, and it has to be dealt with. As I mentioned earlier, that you're a sinner and you uh, married a sinner. So grace and humility are going to be needed because you're going to have times you're going to wrong each other or think differently now there, there are three common negative ways that people deal with conflict and this is not just in a marriage this is in relationships and um, one is the graveyard process and um, that's to bury it to ignore it um, as if it never happened that might be the sweep under the rug or it might be the silent treatment type of an idea um, that I'm just not going to talk about this and I'm not going to tell you what I think, or I'm not going to feel, and, um, and we re don't actually ever resolve it. I heard, I heard a story about a husband and wife who were both in a, in a, a, a conflict, um, a disagreement, and they were giving each other the silent treatment. And you know how sometimes that can happen, it can go on for days. Well, he didn't want to break the silence, but the next day he was flying out early in the morning to catch a flight for work, and... He needed his wife to set the alarm and wake him up at a certain time. So he didn't want to break the silence. So he jotted on a, on a note, please wake me up by 5 a.m. so I can catch my flight. He said it right next to her on her bedstand. Well, he woke up the next morning. She's not in bed. And it was like 9 o'clock. He'd overslept. He was like, oh, he's so frustrated. He looked down at the note and it said, it is 5 a.m. Wake up. <laughs> so... Some of us, that's the way we deal. Uh, it's, if we don't resolve it. It's, it's the silent treatment. It's the graveyard aspect. And other of us are our battlefield. 
that, that we express it in a wrong way. We express everything. We haven't had time. We don't take time to process, to, to give grace. It's, man, I'm going to load up the guns and I'm going to give it to you. Um, I'm going to tell you everything that I'm feeling um, and everything I think about you. And we say too much. We say way too much in those times. Um, and the other, the other negative way that people sometimes communicate in conflict is a courtroom setting. And, and that aspect is as a lawyer who, who's a case lawyer, they aren't listening to their side. They're just seeking to win the case. It's not about resolving it. It's about making sure that I was heard and I won. You lost. When all three of those negative ways, whether it's the, the graveyard, we sweep on the rug or silent treatment, or whether it's the battle mode or the court ro- courtroom mode, the conflict never got resolved. And we didn't build the relationship closer. We destroyed it more. And so that's not the right way to resolve conflict. And the reality is, is anybody, anybody can be in a, can, can quarrel. The, I like the way that Solomon says it. In Proverbs 20, verse 3, it says, It is honorable for any man to stop striving, since any fool can start a quarrel. You know, any, any fool can do that. But it's honorable to stop the quarrel, to, to work it through and resolve the conflict. So the, the question that is, well, how then? How do I resolve the conflict? Let me give you a couple things here. One, be willing to overlook an offense. Sometimes, to say, you know what, I'm going to forgive them even though they didn't ask. I'm going to overlook an offense. Proverbs 19, verse 11 says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. You know, I, there's times when you just say, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. It's not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I, I love my wife, or I love my husband too much. I love my parents, or I love this person, not my friend. It's not worth having this conflict. I'm going to just choose to forgive them and to love them and i'm not just sweeping on the rug saying i'm going to store this for later on i'm saying it's i I forgive it there's grace applied over that Uh, another thing that important to help here is to be honest and open in statements and questions don't assume don't assume their intentions a lot of times in conflicts we assume why you did this well you did this because well maybe it wasn't because of that a lot of times when we, we don't clarify, hey, you did this and that hurt me. Did you do this because of this? When this happened, I felt like this. Am I correct in this? And so clarifying is helpful in that and having openness and honesty in that. I, 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 love, I love what uh, uh, Paul had wrote there in 1 Corinthians 13, that love hopes all things. Love seeks to think the best about the other person. So I'm not going to assume the worst about them. And and so love hopes all things. Uh, Thirdly is to confront and discuss at a proper time and place. Um, Sometimes when there's conflict going on, it's not the right proper place in the middle of Walmart with all kinds of people around. Or in the middle of a busy church lobby. Find a proper time and place when the two of you can talk it through um, and, and, and have a good discussion as we talked about that, a little bit about that before. Then, fourthly, use soft words carefully chosen. Grievous words stir up anger, the Bible says. But soft, a soft answer um, turns away wrath. Soft answers turns away wrath. It's amazing how you can diffuse a situation by a soft word. I have seen that so many times in situations. I can give you illustrations of that that when a soft word was used, this person who was hot, and you come in and you just you just kindness, they start to calm down and realize, oh, they're not wanting to fight back. And then you can actually get down and to actually resolve conflict and build a relationship. So use soft words, carefully chosen. Seek forgiveness out of humility and accepting responsibility. And the other reality is that sometimes you just got to say, you know, I'm going to accept my fault in this. The conflicts are a wedge, and the reality is it takes two sides to that wedge, and, and you are part of that side of the wedge. 
And so accepting your part, you know what, I did this, and I'm sorry. I, I was wrong. Here's, here's even better than saying just, I'm sorry. I was wrong when I did this. Will you forgive me? Because I'm sorry still leaves it as that I'm not asking for you to forgive me. I'm just telling you something. But saying, will you forgive me? Says, I'm actually subjecting myself. I recognize I did wrong and I'm seeking your forgiveness. It's you have the right to forgive me. Um, and so saying, I, I did this and I, I, uh, I would like you to forgive me. Will you forgive me? And then the last part there is then be forgiving. For in resolve conflict, we've got to be forgiving. Ephesians 4, 32, be, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, in, as God in Christ forgave you. So we've got to start learning to use those type of words, like I was wrong, and uh, will you forgive me? Um, I love you, thank you, and using the right words in our conflict resolution. There's more we could say on all that, but... I want to move this to the last point here. This one's very short. Just the, the aspect of confidential intimacy. There's a need for that. And this goes back to our very beginning. As we launched this out of Genesis 2, 24 and 25. That, that God designed marriage to be a one flesh union. To be helpers comparable to one another. That we cleave together. There's intimacy together. That there's nothing hidden between the two. The husband and the wife. And... That is so good. Um, be open with your spouse. and Allow them to be open with you. I didn't, I didn't want to end it on the, the conflict aspect. Because that's part of it. But God made your marriage to be, the, to be that as your best friend. That you can talk with. You can share your life with. It is, it, you're in a one flesh union. Uh, that, that demands that we take the time in that. And it demands that we invest in that. Um, make time for genuine communication. Weave your lives together. Making it one. You know, when we were in college, um, then a Pensacola Christian college, uh, some of you have been down there before. They had years ago um, in the commons area, which is kind of like a, just a general area that you can hang out and they had stores and different stuff. And But they had up a, an upper level, they had this place called the Social Hall. Uh, we used to make fun of it because it looked like a giant furniture store, just couches all everywhere. And it was for the serious dating couples that they would go sit in the Social Hall on a couch and just stare and talk. And uh, we used to make fun of them, like how gross, you know, like, come on. Um, but in the reality, I don't think there needs to be like that. I, I mean, you're married, you can do whatever you want to do. I don't care what you do on your couch. But th the reality is the... <laughs> The, the emphasis on having a place to communicate was that they were trying to develop there, was giving a place where couples could get aside and privately be able to talk and to have a private place to do that. That's what we need today. You need the couch time. You need your social hall with your spouse. So how's your couch time? How's that, how's that going in the communication there? Um, is, is your... Is your couch well worn from the time just sitting and talking together? Maybe around the table, whatever it might be. And are you using your words to build up and give life? Are you having the oneness and intimacy in marital communication that God desires? And by the way, as I said before, these principles aren't just only for marriage. It's communication in relationships. Conflict resolution, commending words taking time, all of those are involved in relationships. So it goes back to the initial first question on the quiz. How good of a communicator are you? A scale of one to ten. Zero being I'm not very good to ten being, man, I got it perfect. Listen, there's room for all of us to improve. We, we got to admit that. So let's take the effort and do it. Let's work at growing this, the ability in our relationships to be all that God desired them to be. And then God says, that's, that's the blessing. He calls it very good. He says, this is for your good that I give you this opportunity to have relationships. So marital communication, it's critical. Let's pray together. Father, 
Thank you for just the practical admonitions from your word to help us um, develop better relationships. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us as we evaluate that in our own lives, as we take some of these principles and put them into practice. God, I pray here at First Baptist Church that, that not only in marriages may you strengthen those and make those healthier than they have ever been before as, as husbands and wives invest and seek after this, but also just in all relationships here. That, God, it, it, it may be between um, uh, friends or um, it may be between parents and children or whatever. Would you help us that we would learn to communicate better, to have better relationships that honor you, and then that are the blessing that you desired for us to have in them. Thank you for making us relational and giving us the opportunity, the ability to have these relationships with one another. May we honor you and glorify you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.